Hey, what is up guys? JTX here today. I wanted to quickly talk about one of the builds I've been playing. This is actually going to be a Bleed Bow Raider. So using some of the brand new tech that we discovered this league that previously was not possible. The tech I'm talking about is using the Olesis Delight Belt to gain maximum affliction charges while also using your Rout Catches in Patience. Now in the past, this wasn't possible because Olesis Delight pretty much means you removed your Frenzy Charges from your character, which is very important for a lot of builds for both attack speed and for damage. Now with the new mod on Rally Caches, with it counting as you having maximum Frenzy Charges, means that you have all the benefits of having maximum Frenzy Charges, but without actually having to have those Charges, meaning you can convert all your Charges into Affliction Charges, or Brutal Charges, or whatever Charge you want, while still maintaining all the bonuses of those said Frenzy Charges. Now why is this so powerful with a build like Bleed Bow, or just for any DOT build in general? A Affliction Charge actually grants 8% more damage with ailments per charge, and 8% more effective non-damaging ailments. This is actually ridiculously strong if you stack Frenzy Charges, because not only do you get the benefits of Frenzy Charges, which is about 4% more damage per Frenzy Charge, as well as the Attack Speed, Cast Speed, you also get 8% more damage with ailments. So on this build, I have a total of 8 Frenzy Charges, which means I also get 8 Affliction Charges, which is 64% more damage with ailments, uh, such as like my Bleed. And I also get to keep the benefits of having the 8 Frenzy Charges. This actually makes Olesis Delight one of the best in slot belts now for DOT builds. So previously for Bleed Bow, it was always been Rislathas. But Rislathas had one of the downsides of uh, creating a big variance in your damage range. So your minimum and your maximum go a bit higher. And this also combines really, really well with Usurper's Penance. And Usurper's Penance gives you 4% Dot Multi per Frenzy Charge. So we have 8 total Frenzy Charges, which gives us 32% more Dark Multi and also makes our Bleeds steal damage 4% faster, so our Bleeds are 32% faster. Now this is actually a, a Ranger variant, normally uh, people run it as a Gladiator. All of this tech as well is being done on other Gladiator classes, it's really really powerful on Gladiators because they can take the Slayer's Masterful Form node from Forbidden Flame, Forbidden Flesh, which makes your Endurance Charges equal to your Maximum Frenzy Charges, then you stack up 8 of those, so you also kind of count as having maximum endurance charges so you you get eight endurance charges for free which is re also really really powerful in combination with everything else i've previously mentioned i've tested every single ascendancy for ranger so i started as a pathfinder toxic rain and we rolled into pathfinder bleed bow and then i tried dead eye and then i finally ended on raider i think raider's given me the most smooth experience so far with the new interaction with alessis delight and rally catches and patience and stacking a bunch of frenzy charges not only does the build feel amazingly fast to play it's smooth and you have a crazy amount of damage it's also probably been one of the most well-rounded characters I've played in terms of both mapping and bossing. I've taken on all of the uber content in this game now with this character. So I've done uber maven, done the feared, I've done uh, uber shaper. Uh, it's It's been really, really powerful for all those boss encounters. It also maps incredibly well because we have constant onslaught and we have really, really fast attack speed and move speed in maps, as well as having perma phasing thanks to our ascendancy uh, thoughts infusion. So it was very, very smooth at mapping. The other item I want to talk about itself is uh, Kintsugi. Kintsugi is one of the an older chess piece that just pretty much is meant for uh, evasion or more dodge heavy classes. Pretty much means the first hit that you take when you have a Kintsugi on does 35% less damage. So the very first hit we take, we have a much higher effective hit pool against the very first hit. Obviously after we get hit, uh, we lose that 35% damage reduction, but we also get an increase in evasion rating. So we get up to around 90%-ish evasion rating uh, in Ruth maps. And then we, when we have Val Grace on, you hit dodge cap. It's actually very, very unlikely that you get hit multiple times in a row with this build, unless you're deliberately trying to jump into packs and let them uh, swarm you. This build is actually very, very safe in terms of being able to zip around and avoid most damage. This build is definitely more of what we call a dodge tank. So we rely on not getting hit. And also if we do get hit, we have a big uh, mitigation for our first, very first hit. I have tested Pathfinder, Deadeye, and Raider. Uh, all of the classes have their own strengths and weaknesses. On Pathfinder, the advantages were that you did have permanent fast sustain, you had decent amount of defense and a decent amount of movement speed. Only problem I noticed that it lacked damage and had trouble getting access to damage outside of getting ridiculously strong gear to kind of like round out your character. Even then, I felt like the damage was very, very hard to scale up to the end game. For Deadeye, that I had much better clear with the, the additional projectiles, the chain, and a decent amount of movement speed with Tailwind. The only problem was our defenses were obviously not the best. We lose the flasks from Pathfinder and we also lose a lot of the mitigation. And in reality, all the projectiles that we do get don't really benefit Bleed Bow that much because we're a DOT build and we already fire 14 arrows by default with Split Arrow. So those extra two projectiles aren't a huge deal. Tailwind was also a little bit annoying to keep up because you have, you have to get to 10 stacks. And as soon as your flask drops off and your tailwind drops off, you're actually very, very slow in maps. 
So it didn't really feel great if you were going between maps or going between packs and if you want constantly killing things, then uh, you, your build would feel a little bit on the slower side. The other issue was that then I kind of shared the same problem with the Pathfinder where you had lack of damage available to you outside of your gear. You couldn't really scale a crazy amount unless uh, you got ridiculously powerful gear. And then you'd also have to do a bunch of aura scaling, which is similar to what I talked about previously in my Gladiator videos. And then I finally landed on Raider, and then we got to try the new tech with Olesses plus Valakesh. And that's when the build started to feel really, really good. Everything that the Raider kit gives to the build actually is incredibly powerful. So Onslaught gives us great attack speed for our snipe channeling and also constant movement speed in maps without relying on flasks. Force Infusion gives us a really nice source of suppression, so our gear is less, our gear and tree is less dependent on getting suppressed. It also gives us phasing, which comes into importance later for capping our elemental element avoidance. And we also get a crazy amount of both attack speed, movement speed, evasion rating, everything really, really good for making the build a really, really fast mapper. And overall, I think Raider was a more complete package than both the Deadeye and the Pathfinder. I think Raider was by far the best experience. Alternatively, I think you can run it as a Gladiator with a very, very similar effect. The only thing I note that Gladiator has a similar problem with calendar charges compared to Deadeye, where you're going to have to actually ramp up these charges um, at the beginning of a map or on boss fights to actually get the full effect. But with the Valakesh's Impatience Boost, you do have access to all your friendly charges, so it's not so bad. I think in terms of Gladiator versus Raider, I think Gladiator is going to be a little bit more tanky, but it's going to be a little bit more slow. I think eventually both damages when you reach the dot cap with your setups. And at that point, it'll just be about whether you want a more fast character or you want a more tanky character. I think that's the main differences between Gladiator and a Raider. But now our ascendancy is the actual main reason why we can run Bleed Bow now in almost any class. It doesn't have to be Gladiator, it doesn't have to be Raider. It can be almost any class now simply because we can get the Bleed mod. So bleeding enemies, you kill explode, dealing 5% of the max life. This can be available in any single class now in the form of either a charm or a jewel called that which was taken. This allows a lot of build diversity now for not just Bleed Bow, but for a lot of other builds, whereas previously certain Ascendancy points were just locked on characters through Forbidden Flame or Forbidden Flesh, or just through the Ascendancy nodes itself. For the actual charms we want to run here, obviously we want to run one of the bleeding enemies you kill for the clear aspect, and we also run a chance to avoid elemental elements while phasing, and as we have Quartz Infusion, we're permanently phasing. This gives us 24% chance, and over here gives us another 25% chance. So this gives us 49% chance to avoid elemental elements, whilst the rest of it is capped out by our uh, ancestral vision here. So with 100% suppressed, we get 50% elemental element avoidance. Ideally, go for a 25% roll on both of your charms, so you don't have to overcap your suppress, which is what I'm doing here. I actually have 102% spell suppression, so my uh, avoidance can be capped. You don't have to do this if you get max rolls for both of the elemental element avoidance while phasings. Also, our banner skills have no reservation, and Increase mana reservation efficiency of skills. The, both of these charms are really, really important because we lose the chance slot for my helmet compared to previous leagues for mana reservation. This lets us squeeze in all of our auras a lot more easily. And also, because we're running a unique helmet this time, we don't have to roll for one of those mana reservation helmets or chests. So th those charms just help out with actually getting fitting most of our auras in. And I think the flexibility granted by the Primalist is uh, very, very hard to beat. I'll quickly also talk about the Tinctures this league and the Warden Ascendancy. Now, in a previous video, uh, I mentioned how strong uh, Tinctures are. Now, I think Tinctures can be very, very strong in the mid to early game for Bleed Boat because it does provide a lot of utility for almost no cost. So Tinctures like this, which give you a chance to refresh your bleeding duration on hits really, really powerful in terms of using our puncture and snipe setup. It actually changes the playstyle entirely where you'll just be puncturing at the very start of the fight and then you'll just be constantly using split arrow to refresh your bleed stacks. I used this uh, for a long time and I got to feel that it was very, very nice in terms of the playstyle. It also gives you 30% more damage on your first hit against non-bleeding enemies, so also really, really powerful. Normally, if you want to actually use this flask effectively, you have to make sure your snipe slash puncture setup costs zero mana. So your staring arrow and your, your mana force setup does not trigger. So, so that doesn't actually create the first bleeding hit. Otherwise, you lose your 30% damage bonus. So you can just adjust your rings or amulet style a little bit so you can actually run snipe with zero mana. I would recommend that if you're running tinctures. But ultimately, in the end game, I think charms are the superior option because you do get a crazy amount of value from charms. And when you do start hitting the higher levels of bleed and getting dot cap, you don't really care about having 30% more damage on your bleed or refreshing the bleed duration. It's not really worth dropping 
uh, all the charms for that as well as your flask slot. I also wanted to talk about another cool thing about playing the ranger class type. We get access to a dead eye ascendancy called rupturing. Rupturing is a ascendancy that lets you stack ruptures onto mobs up to a maximum of three. Each rupture occurs when you crit while also bleeding an enemy. You no longer run resolute technique and you need to actually run an accuracy and a bit of crit. But that being said, if you can find a way of doing that, you get an incredible damage bonus in terms of what rupturing does. I think this is like one of the few times people have actually used rupturing. It's a very, very unknown ascendancy for dead eyes and even for the ranger class in general. I think it's actually pretty powerful for bleed if you can figure out the prerequisites and I think bleed bow can be a very effective method of stacking on ruptures. So the way that I've actually solved uh, rupturing to allow us to have a decent amount of crit rate and also to have a decent amount of accuracy uh, simply revolves us around taking some nodes on our tree to give us a bit of crit chance. So particularly here, 80% increase critical strike chance against bleeding enemies. Since we'll always be bleeding our targets, we'll always have this crit strike chance against those enemies. We also run this mastery that gives 100 accuracy rating for green socket on our bow. We normally run four to five green sockets on our bow. So this will give us a good 400 flat accuracy rating. We run a precision to give us a little bit more accuracy and crit strike chance as well as a uh, war banner here which gives us a bit more accuracy. All of this combines to give us a really decent pool of accuracy and we can kind of top that off with a quiver or a ring with a flat accuracy roll on it and then we'll reach 100% chance strike to hit and then we'll also be sitting at around 20% chance by, by default because we have the power charges from Ralakesh's boots constantly on us and then once we hit leading targets and also Ball of Faith which gives increased critical strike chance against enemies on consecrated ground we sit about 33% chance to critically strike an enemy and we're attacking about four times per second with split arrow so we'll be stacking up those rupture stacks in a fight pretty consistently and we'll get the full value of these energy there. Also, I thought I'd share a cool tech that, that's been around for a couple of leagues now. With an impossible escape, you can actually get a crazy amount of value from your timeless jewels. So for example, we have the impossible escape for glancing blows here. And with our timeless jewel converting all of these nodes and notables here into the respective timeless jewels ones, we can grab uh, multiple damage nodes like this compared to previously only taking these two. This allows a lot more value in how we want to choose our points. So in this case, I'm taking about 100, 160% physical damage and 50% damage with bleeding across three nodes. And this node's also set 37% chaos resistance. So I can take four really powerful nodes uh, just by running a possible escape. I've also been asked a lot about the new split arrow of splitting and how I think it is for bleed bow. I tested it multiple times with different setups and different uh, support gems. I think it's a very, very viable alternative depending on your play style. So split arrow of splitting is just shoots a single target and then it's kind of a little bit like tornado shot that the arrows single arrow explodes into uh, into like eight smaller ones and then those all seek the target and they hit an enemy. I've tested it with uh, Chain, with Fork, with Pierce. I think Fork gave the best result. By default, projectiles put towards eight targets. You can scale this up for with additional projectiles or arrows. I tested this with GMP and I tested it with, with plus couple plus arrows on Quiver or Bow. I think you want to look for maybe like 11 or 12 to be your sweet spot. In terms of arrow, additional arrows and then probably run it with a fork. The also added benefit is the damage effectiveness on this gem is 160 compared to the split arrows 120. With this level of damage effectiveness your single target technically is a lot better with split arrow splitting. I noticed that earlier on when I didn't have as much gear or damage using split arrow splitting allowed me to kill the empowered rares a lot easier compared to just a regular split arrow. It also felt like I could use this as a pseudo single target skill without having to rely on my puncture snipe. That being said though, I still believe Split Arrow is superior in terms of clearing, especially when you run it with an Awakened Chain. When you do get to a certain level of damage, you don't get as much value from Split Arrow splitting because your Split Arrow will be hitting hard enough to kill rares pretty consistently. But that being said, I think it is personal preference whether you want Split Arrow of splitting or regular Split Arrow. I think Split Arrow of splitting has its place, especially in the early to mid game, where you want immediate damage against rares and tankier mobs instead of relying on your puncture snipe setup. Test it how you guys want. I had the best results with stacking a bunch of projectiles onto it and adding a fork. Potentially there are other ways you can scale it as well. That's just my experience with split arrow splitting. I think it's a very viable alternative. I'll quickly go into the rest of my gear here. I already touched on some of the new uniques that we're using. For our bow, we're actually using a spine bow now compared to a regular citadel bow. A spine bow simply because it has a good attack speed and has a good base crit strike chance. Uh, this is just mainly for our rupturing ascendancy. If you're not playing with the rupturing ascendancy and you're just going regular resolute technique, go with a citadel bow. Aim for a high fizz roll and try to get a dot multi onto it. For our gloves, we're running some very generic uh, life, chaos res, suppressed gloves, and also a bit of fizz dot multi on the implicit. For our ring, uh, we're running a warlord ring with cursed enemies with vulnerability on hit. This is a chaos resistance base ring 
and also it has the crafter mod for channelings because of minus three to total mana cost. These rings are very flexible in how you want to do them. You can have a synthesized ring with cursed enemies with vulnerability on hit. You could have a onslaught on hit ring uh, if you're not playing as a raider. Main thing is you want to try pick up some stats here. So like your intelligence, ideally, um, the build needs a bit of intelligence and you can pick that up on the rings here. So I'd recommend getting intelligence on one of your rings. Other ring itself is just a generic life resistance uh, and then minus mana cost craft ring. Our amulet is an Alza Uprising, really, really powerful in for this build to squeeze in as many auras as we can. So I'm running a Grace Alza Uprising here. It does not have to be Grace. You can just be the cheapest one for whichever auras that you are running. So in our case, we're running Grace, Malevolence, uh, Pride. So which, out of those three, whichever one's the cheapest. And we have a Noted Fnatic here for an additional plus one max Frenzy Charge because we are stacking Frenzy Charges to get our maximum value from our belt. Well, the Quiver. It's a double dot multi quiver with accuracy and life. We want to look for an attack speed base, ideally, because we want to make sure our split arrow and our snipe is as smooth as possible with enough attack speed. The rest of the gear I've pretty much covered is just going to be Rallakesh's for the new effect. I think Rallakesh is incredibly powerful in its current state. I think a lot of builds can fit a Rallakesh and just see only upsides. I think it's ridiculously cheap for what it does right now. I think they're sitting about one divine each. I'm not surprised if these pair of boots become best in slot for a lot of builds because it's just so valuable having permanent endurance frenzy power charges from a single item. Uh, and then you can also really abuse it with the Maven belts. So you can get uh, brutal charges with the red belt. You can get absorption charges with the intelligence uh, belt. All of them really, really powerful effects while also allowing you to keep the base effects of endurance frenzy power respectively. For our flask, we're just running a Corrupting Blood Immunity Life Flask. We're running a Increased Movement Speed Quicksilver Flask, uh, Evasion Rating Jade Flask. Uh, we're running a Ruby Flask here. It doesn't have to be Ruby, it could be Sapphire, it could also be Topaz. Uh, I'm running Ruby because I run Red Altars. We want to craft reduced mana cost of skills during effect. This is really powerful because it makes it much cheaper for us to channel our Snipe and also makes it much cheaper for our Split Arrow. So it takes off a lot of the mana pressure, uh, especially when you're waiting for a boss fight to start. This flask will make it a lot easier for you to just hold down your Snipe and then time it correctly. A final flask, like previously mentioned, is Bottled Faith. Really good because it gives us additional damage taken on enemies and gives us a bit of crit chance for rupturing. I've already used this flask a lot in the past for previous Bleed Bow characters, but now I actually get the benefit of the crit as well. So really, really powerful. And also it creates Consecrated Ground for a bit of extra regen and reduced curse effect. For the gem links on the bow itself, uh, we're running Split Arrow with Awaken Brutality, Awaken Vicious Proj, Awaken Swift Affliction, Volatility, and Awaken Chain. In our chest six link, we're running a puncture snipe setup with volatility, awaken brutality, awaken vicious proj, and awaken deadly elements. In our gloves, we're running steel skin, war banner, dash, and precision. Helmet, we're running a malevolence linked with an enlighten, herald of purity, and pride. We want to get uh, quality on pride because it does increase the area of effect. So it makes the area that we make enemies take more damage a bit bigger. So we want to take we want to get quality on this. Other gems, it doesn't really matter on our auras to get 20% quality because we don't care about the AOE. But pride, it is very important that we get as much quality as possible. In our boots, we're running our mana forge setup. So we're running snaring arrow with culling strike, mana forged, and grace. Normally we'd fit in a frenzy here, but since we are a raider and we generate frenzies very consistently on attacks. I'm running, I'm, I, I've added in a Culling Strike support here just for a little bit of extra help on a single target and also for bosses. Really handy to have your Culling Strike automated on a Mana Forge setup. For our passive tree itself, this is actually very similar to the previous Gladiator trees that I've done. The only difference is we are grabbing Frenzy Charges wherever we can now. So we're going down here to grab Disciple of Slaughter. We also path away to the right here to get further just to pick up some more Frenzy Charges so we can scale the damage. We are running an Unnatural Instinct here. This is really, really powerful. This is one of the most powerful spots you can put this for Bleed Bow because you get uh, up to, I think, I believe, 72% increased damage, generic increased damage, also giving us a crazy amount of leech, attack speed phasing, all that good stuff. They're only going for like one and a one and a half divine. So for that type of price, it's definitely worth picking one up in this area. It gives us a crazy amount of value. Uh, we're running two cluster setups here, same as before Battle Hardened, Master of the Fundamentals. And the rest of the tree is very similar to a typical Bleed Bow Gladiator build. And we do try grab some Suppress nodes where we can to top up the rest of our Suppress. So a bit of Suppress here and a bit of Suppress here. If you're playing Gladiator, you could potentially go down for Entrench as well, or you can go up for Mage Bane. Those are all choices depending on which version of the build you're playing. Quickly jump into POB here so you can see the numbers for this build. Uh, as you can see here, we're sitting at 8 million 
damage on a single snipe stack. This is just assuming that the enemy has been ensnared or if the enemy is moving. Uh, as we ramp up the number of snipe stacks, we're sitting around uh, 27 million at maximum snipe stages. This also assumes that we have no rupture stacks at all. If we apply one or two rupture stacks onto an enemy, we hit the dot cap pretty easily. Uh, our prior order is also set to initial effect here, so um, there's a lot of ways that we can actually hit the dot cap um, without actually having to have all the right conditions in place. So potentially just hitting a seven stage type with one or two rupture stacks hits you, gets you to the max. If the enemy stay, if the fight goes a bit longer than four or five seconds, you're getting the maximum effect of pride. So you're, there's a lot of damage to go around for this build. You can invest a little bit more into defenses than I have here. I wanted to push this build up to the dot cap so, we, so I could do all the uber fights uh, reliably without having to worry about not having enough damage. If we actually set it to our uber pinnacle bosses, we get to the ideal scenario where we have uh, three rupture stacks on the enemy and we're hitting it with a max uh, snipe. We're still sitting at around 16 million uh, bleed DPS on an uber pinnacle, which I think is pretty respectable for a dot build like this. As for defenses, we are sitting at around uh, 53,000 evasion rating in maps uh, with a 89% chance to evade attacks. If we pop Valgrace, well, obviously we cap out our chance to evade attacks. Uh, also, if we do get hit uh, with Kintsugi, we get around 90% evasion rating. So we're sitting pretty much at, at around 89 to 90% chance to evade enemy attacks throughout maps. As long as our flask is up, if we don't have our flask up, we're still sitting at around 84%. Our effective hit pull is pretty decent. Uh, it's, it's due to Kintsugi's uh, initial hit, allowing us to take a lot more on our very first hit. Uh, we also run a steel skin to increase our effective hit pull. If we drop this steel skin off, we're sitting at around uh, 40,000. Uh, we have a 100% suppression chance as well as having 191% movement speed modified with our flasks up. Without the flasks, we're still sitting at 141% constantly, so this is also on hideout. We're incredibly fast, uh, pretty much always with Onslaught. Our critical strike chance is sitting at, at around 33 to 34%. Now, this also is really, really powerful because Split Arrow Setup will be applying a Rupture stack on average at least once per second, so, we'll, so we will be able to ramp up to three Rupture stacks. Uh, within the 3 second window. This also doesn't factor in our ensnaring arrow setup which can also crit and also bleed so that's also an additional factor that, that can help us ramp up the rupture stacks on the enemy. Normally it just involves us sitting there with a puncture and then stacking our split arrow to apply the ruptures after the after the puncture arrows hit the target. I had a lot of fun playing this character. This was my league start character. It delivered more than I thought it would, especially playing a bleed bow on a class that's outside of gladiator or champion or stereotypical bleed bow classes. I think this build is proof that you can potentially run uh, bleed bow on almost any class. Raider works incredibly well with the current way charms work and our fantasies work. Definitely uh, recommend you guys checking out this as a variant for bleed bow, especially if you want a really, really fast map that can also take on endgame bosses. I think this is actually one of the most well-rounded characters I've made. It feels amazing to play with the permanent onslaught and movement speed in both maps and doing bosses. Once again, guys, thanks to everyone that's been supporting my videos, especially those that come to the live stream at twitch.tv slash JTX. Had a lot of people come and check out the stream, so I really, really appreciate you guys. I try to stream almost every single day if possible. I have a Discord server that I normally ping when I'm about to go live. Hope you guys are having a really good league. I have a lot of interesting projects coming up after this build, including a return of a potential auto bomber that people might be looking forward to see. If you like this video, be sure to drop a like. And if you want to see more content from me, make sure you Make sure to subscribe, got a lot of cool things coming in the future. As always guys, thanks for watching and I will catch you guys in the next video.